So have we decided then I'm going to talk to Jamie then? Yeah. Okay, cool. Jamie. since we've made this album. 17 years, 16 years. So Deadwing was an album that was based on a, a film script I wrote with a very good friend of mine, a film director, commercials director. And the problem with it is, I think, that if there is a problem with it, is that it was based on a script for a movie that no one ever saw. <laughs> so a lot of the songs are about characters that probably have no meaning to anyone but me uh, and, and Mike, the other guy. So I met Mike Benyon back in... Uh, the late 80s, um, he was working in Soho, was looking for someone to do music for, for, um, for TV commercials. And one of the very early things I collaborated with Mike on was a Lego commercial. And I did a really terrible, terrible, lame Metallica kind of uh, copy. But luckily him and the creatives, they weren't really into metal. So they couldn't really see it for the lame attempt that it was. So I kind of got away with it. So I ended up doing the music for that, that TV commercial and that kind of started a collaboration that lasted for several years. Having that kind of life, a financial lifeline in a way liberated me to not have to worry about monetizing my, my own projects, uh, which is a good, good thing because they weren't making any money. So Porky Pantry and No Man, you know, were, were kind of labors of love at that point. I was going out and touring and making records, but not making any money. To fast forward, I think probably to around the early 2000s, I think Mike was getting a bit fed up with TV, the world of TV, TV commercials. And like a lot of people that start out making TV commercials and, and pop videos, his ultimate aspiration was to make a feature. So well, what I said to him one day, well, why don't you and I sit down and write a script? Very much, you know, drawing from the kind of movies that we love. And we talked about the movies we love, things like Coppola's The Conversation and David Lynch movies and Kubrick movies. So, you know, so let's start, let's try and write something in that vein, you know, that you can then show around to production companies and agents and actors and try and get it off the ground. Very naively, we thought that would be if we had the script, that would be easy. To cut a long story short, we spent about a year working on this script, uh, which went through several titles and we ended up with the title Deadwing. That was it really. So we, we wrote the script and started, I think we probably finished the first draft around about the time Porky Pantry was finishing in absentia or going on tour. So we ended up with this script that we thought was really great and we couldn't even get anyone to read the damn thing. At the same time, I was just beginning to write think about writing for the next tree record and I didn't have anything specifically I wanted to write about and I thought okay let's be pragmatic about this if I write a bunch of songs based on the movie script and the album does well maybe that'll help to, you know to get the the movie script to at least be looked at you know by people killing two birds with one stone I thought okay let's take the the characters let's take the ideas and let's write a concept album around around this movie script that we've written and that's what I did so I wrote a bunch of songs based on these characters David and Elizabeth and the concept which was about this religious cult and um, 
this little kid escapes from this he's the only person that escapes from this big mass suicide of this religious cult at the beginning of the movie and then you flash forward 20 years and you see this guy working in Soho in the sound studio we based it very much in things that we knew and part of it was based on Mike's career working in Soho and so it was a little bit obscure and a little bit oblique all the imagery the front cover um, all of the the image the, the collages inside which were done by Mike all of the photography that Lassa did, all of the lyrics, almost all the lyrics, were based on this script that nobody had read, <laughs> this movie that no one had seen. But, uh, you know, on the plus side, it, it gave me um, a very fertile sort of strand of, of things to write about. And I guess a lot of the themes in the movie are, are universals anyway. Um, you know, nostalgia for childhood, regret, past catching up with you. So in that sense, I kind of, I guess I had faith in the fact that the the ideas would transcend the specifics of, of the characters anyway. And I think that's probably true because people, certainly a song like Lazarus, I think people have definitely related to that over the years. So it, it probably has a universality, almost despite the fact that it is, Technically, it's very specifically about two characters in a movie, in a, in a situation, in a movie. But I think it, it kind of, it has a universality almost despite itself. I mean, to be honest, I did read the the script, uh, the the movie script, and I I don't know if I really took it on board. You know, I couldn't give you a synopsis of the plot. Um, I could sort of see how maybe it related more to the artwork that came later, and the sort of atmosphere of the whole thing. Um, and then I could tell that obviously in the lyrics there was stuff that was relating to the script. I could sense this storytelling that was going on that was slightly different to the, to the previous albums. So, um, so it wasn't a surprise to hear that um, maybe four or five tracks were, were linked to this uh, script. Uh, and and we, read, we read the script, myself and my wife went, th went through it, really liked it. Um, but I think he's, he's doing it now in a different form, different name and a few few adjustments I think but yeah some sort of ghost story isn't it that's it I'd never read the script um he never I don't think he ever gave me the script I don't think it was reading the script would have made me play the drums differently so I think um most of them are related to the characters on, on uh, in the movie to be honest Deadwing obviously the title track is Lazarus certainly is in fact Lazarus even references David the main character in the script Open Car Is, Arriving Somewhere But Not Here Is, Halo Isn't, Shallow Isn't. It's probably something like 50-50 or perhaps slightly more in favour. So it's quite impenetrable in a way, certainly lyrically, conceptually, it's quite impenetrable. But I think um, musically, it was definitely a period when the band was definitely at a, at a kind of peak. Coming out of In Absentia, which I think was a real breakthrough record for us, having integrated Gavin into the band properly, um, Gavin Harrison, the, the, the new drummer, as was on In Absentia, was now fully integrated into the band. Gavin had almost arrived in the band at a point where we were just beginning to break through to another level. And I think we, I was very aware, certainly, that Gavin could have chosen to do, do anything. Gavin had a very successful career as a session musician, making an awful lot of money going and touring Italy with these megastars in Italy. Could quite easily have done that, but he chose to throw his lot in with us. A band that was still very much at a grassroots level. I was very conscious of that. In fact, I remember having a meeting with him early on where I almost tried to talk him out of joining the band because I didn't want, I didn't want to feel the pressure of um, feeling like I might have let him down, that it wasn't quite at the level that he would have wanted it to be. And it wasn't. And to his, to his credit, I think he acknowledged that and he understood that and he said to himself, no, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to throw my lot in with these guys and I think we can build this into something bigger. But I was conscious of that and, and I, think, I think I was um, raising my game all the time because of that. But he's also, you know, he's a very easy to get along with guy and, and he's, very, he's very funny. I think when any one person changes in the band, the dynamic between you 
between the characters kind of changes a little bit. And for better or worse, the sound of the band becomes those characters. It's, it's the product of those, you know, the melting together of those characters. And uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm different to the previous drummer, Chris Maitland, and probably um, Colin, Richard and Steve kind of, you know, molded around me and we became something new. Gavin was very interested in writing with me and we, st we still write together. You know, in fact, we've written a bunch of the songs for the new record, Closure Continuation, together. And the way it works with Gavin writing has pretty much been the same since the very beginning, which is that he comes up with interesting rhythms. And it then becomes a problem for me to solve. I mean that in a positive way. I always remember the painter René Magritte said that every painting was him as was every painting he painted was a problem he had to solve. So he he had this idea: how can I how can I paint a train? In my how, what that's the problem I'm going to solve: how to paint a train, how to paint a man with a bowler hat. And I think in a way, it's the same with Gavin. He'll present me with a rhythm, and my problem is: how can I turn that into a song? Because Gavin never gives you an obvious. He's not just going to sit down and give you an obvious 4-4 four, four groove. In fact, usually they're in time signatures that are, let's just say, less conventional. Start with something beautiful being a great example. Yeah, start with something beautiful. Start with something beautiful. We played that live a lot. Um, and yeah, one of the best tracks on the album, Gavin wrote that one with Stephen. And um, I can't remember what time signature it's in, I think it's nine, I'm not sure, um, but it's just got this really lovely groove and it's different. You can tell that that's not Stephen writing a song on his own. It, it's, it's still Porcupine Tree but you can tell there's this other influence coming through. Yeah, well he came up with a lot of the rhythmic ideas, like unusual stuff, um, so I really enjoyed, uh, well Start of Something Beautiful was also a co-write with him. So that kind of rhythmic pattern he came up with, it's sort of uh, interesting tempo and interesting uh, kind of meshing of all the different parts. Uh, that's probably my favourite one, actually. Fascinating, I mean, amazing rhythm, you know. Just, it's just fun to listen to that rhythm, but how am I going to turn that into something that, that you know, can be a pork country piece? When I did find the answers to those problems, sometimes they resulted in really strong, really strong pieces. What Gavin does with patterns and the, the, the way that he can change different time signatures yet the whole thing sounds so smooth um, and, and interlocked is, is, is brilliant and um, I love the groove of that track and yeah I think it's one of the most interesting tracks on the album. Gavin wasn't about old-fashioned classic rock drumming, it had a real cutting edge to it. And that seemed to gel very well with where I was going with the music anyway. Richard had to find a way into that too because he suddenly found with all these big metal riffs he had to almost alter his approach to how he approached keyboards. He had to find the space between for all his little you know sound design elements and keyboard elements and again to his credit he, he kind of rose to the challenge and, and, and I think in doing all those things we began to create this really unique sound. I've kind of got used to it a little bit on the previous album, in Absentia. Um, so, yeah, you, you have to employ a certain amount of restraint and not try to force yourself on, on the music. If, if, if there isn't the space for you, then there isn't. So you try to find these pockets of space and um, areas where you can introduce your own personality or try to bring some kind of atmosphere to the track or a certain mood. Um, and I, I started to get pretty good at that. Um, so I think I managed. Um, it's a sonic thing, you know? It's, uh, it's finding the right frequencies and the right position for the sound. And also having a good kind of working relationship with Stephen, who we both have a love of kind of electronic music. And so he can kind of hear what I'm trying to do and, and he can help with finding that space as well started a process of it feeling more like a democratic unit and democratic band rather than a kind of dictatorship. 
Gavin certainly is a very is a, is a very strong personality, and so he wanted to be more involved in the creative side. And of course, when Gavin started to assert himself, the others kind of, you know, did similarly and said, "Okay, well, we want to be involved too." So I wrote a few songs with Gavin, just the two of us together early on, and then we started to have these group sort of jam sessions. Yeah, I mean, it was the first time ever that I tried to write with a band in a room like that. Um, you know, actually trying to compose on the spot. I think they had done it, you know, with Chris Maitland in the past, uh, but it was the first time for me. And yeah, I think it was very productive. We got a lot of stuff. Plus there was lots of, as with every writing session and jam session, there was lots of stuff that had potential, it had a good chorus but we, Stephen couldn't find a good lyric for, or a good melody for the verse, or we thought it was a bit weak, so probably on a hard drive somewhere there's probably another five or six pieces that were half written but we thought, oh, that's got some potential, and then we didn't bother developing it. It's always good to be sort of in a room together and interacting in, in real time, isn't it? You know, and making decisions together. But it, it's just, uh, I don't want it to, uh, this session I really wanted to sound like a, a band, just a live band going ballistic. Oh, all right. It's just that I didn't know what was going to go on top of it. Some kind of solo. I right. Don't know, I don't know what yet. What I think worked best was people just bringing small elements, you know, like a, I'd have a bass riff or Gavin would have a rhythm or, you know, Richard had a sequence or something or Steve maybe had a riff, you know, and just, just these small parts and trying to mesh them together. And then once we had a, a, a sort of shape maybe on the computer, because it's quite easy to edit basic ideas into a sort of arrangement, Steve would usually take it away if it was something he felt inspired by. We had input into into the recording, um, you know, often we'd record our own things. Um, we made our own decisions. So it was it was a point where Gavin was becoming more integrated into the band and also the band was um, getting more involved in the production, in the arrangements um, and even even writing as well. Yeah, you always end up doing something you wouldn't have done if it was just you or just you and someone else, having all four of us there did, for better or worse, make those demos go in that way. I had a sort of idea, I haven't perfected it of course, but uh, I had a manic idea about giving it some really hard, fast, sort of industrial drums going at double time through this. <laughs> The songs that we wrote together, I think are really strong. Halo and Glass Arm Shattering is a beautiful song. So there was a little bit of politics going on uh, in trying to keep everyone happy. But you know what? That's, that's being in a band. And in a way, that's part of, of what's good about being in a band. Finding a kind of commonality. You don't always get your own way. Um, but at the same time, you have to recognise that the other side of that coin is that, that this gestalt thing, this sort of combination of personalities, is what makes the band special in the first place. So you can't control that all the time. You know, like um, star yeah. fuckers. Well, sure about that. Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Certainly on, on Dead Wing and on the following Amphira of a Blank Planet, it was a really healthy thing uh, for me, and I felt, I felt good about it. Well, again, rather than pinpoint any one one thing, I mean, what I always like about Colin was he has these two sides where there's there's a dubby side that's quite kind of uh, it's like a sub bass kind of thing, very round and smooth, and um, it holds things down really nicely. And he's got very nice kind of low tone, um, and you could probably see some history in what Colin, Colin's music that he likes coming through in his playing, you know. I was quite pleased with um, Glass Arm Shattering in that um, I did this kind of double stop chordal thing on the bass, which in a band as sonically dense as Portimine Tree, I wouldn't usually have the chance to, 
to do anything like that, but it ended up being a kind of blissful sort of vibe on that tune. feeling quite pleased that I sort of found a context for it, you know, it turned into one of the songs on the record, so I was really pleased with that, sort of the way it became a whole mood, you know. Um, actually, Colin came up, I think, with the bass line that started, he came up with this bass line for So Called Friend, and that was part of a jam as well, or a writing session that inspired that whole uh, Song. I think the whole first song in seven actually, um, and that was a really good. I don't, that was an extra song that wasn't on the album, one of the B sides. But we used to play it live, and it went down really, really well. As did Mother and Child Divided. Uh, my favourite Richard moment on Dead Moon is probably uh, the start of Something Beautiful. He does a solo about five and a half minutes in, in the instrumental section at the end. I thought it was great the way he did that. Um, yeah, quite un there's something unexpected about the way he played it. I mean, it, it, it's sort of uh, not a million, you know, it's sort of like something, almost a signature thing, but he did it really, really nicely. Well, kind of my moments happen in, um, happen in phases. <laughs> Usually intros, middle sections, outros. Um, I'm quite pleased with what I did at the beginning of uh, arriving somewhere. Stephen already had this, he had an organ kind of um, texture going on there at the beginning and he, he wanted something, he wanted a, a kind of sound design thing really and so I created this, this kind of uh, whole backdrop that slowly, slowly builds and leads you up to the moment that you get the first chord change and it's quite a dramatic moment. Um, so I had it with lots of kind of little lo-fi synths, little sounds, uh, ticking clock, uh, kind of um, weird Arabic instrument thing that I, uh, uh, I found in, in software actually, on a, uh, on a software synth called Absinthe. And it's actually one of the only preset sounds I've ever used in my life. I always change, you know, I always make my own patches. Often I start from scratch, but this just, was so playable and so such a such a great sound to 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 play with it worked so well for that track that, that I just used it. Uh, well, no, we started in the end. Of, we started at the end of March. Oh, you mean in America? Yeah, we just come to America. Until we'd signed to Atlantic Records on the previous record, we'd never had the funds to be able to tour America at all, really, you know. So we were able to do that, and it was working. We could see it working. That yes, we were we were going still going to places and playing to 20 people, but the places on the previous tour that we'd been doing that, now it was 500 people. So we could see how it was growing. Yeah, we did a, I suppose, a double headliner with OPEF, and it was great. Uh, I mean, they're great guys and a really great band. And it seemed to be like quite a good match, actually, for the fans. We played our heavier stuff and they played their lighter stuff. And we almost met in the middle. I think at the time we did the Opeth tour, it was a really good, um, it was a really good thing for both of us because we were both at a similar level um, and we both had a, a crossover audience. Um, so it was a sort of compatible, uh, a compatible support. That was enjoyable, that was fun and I think it might have benefited us more than them probably because we were doing our heavier set which their audience quite liked um, but they were doing their very kind of acoustic-y gentle set which their audience didn't like but our audience did. So it kind of worked for both of us in different ways. That was one of the things that made sense. And I think we'd also began to attract a lot more metal kids on that tour, particularly in America. All around the world too, like order them off the internet. Nuts. You from around here then? Uh, yeah, Rochester. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like 60 miles away. Oh. 
we were kind of connecting with a lot some of those people so you know it, it it was interesting being reminded that it was very much a transitional period for us i think i can also see that we were we were having a lot of fun and we were enjoying it and the band were were really good we were really good at that time <laughs> We've been playing with Gavin for two or three years by then, and Gavin really had raised the whole level of the band. He was such a phenomenal musician. He'd kind of raised the professionalism of the band on a, on a nightly basis, and I was enjoying that. <laughs> With Porcupine Tree, it's always been very incremental. Um, we, we never got that huge surge that, that you see with a, a lot of artists, um, probably primarily because we didn't uh, have any hit singles or we were never a particularly trendy band at any one time. But things were, were going in the right direction. Touring sort of felt, uh, it got to the point where it was quite a grind, in all honesty, um, and it wasn't, it wasn't lucrative at all, we were lucky to break even most of the time. Shall we? Yeah. There's bollocks! Yeah. Bollocks. Um, but we could still feel, I think, well, I certainly felt that we were slowly going to bigger venues, we were getting to more people, there were people coming along that didn't know us. Um, they were all really positive things, and it was around the time of the Dead Wing Tour that I think we sort of got a bit of more, I hesitate to use the word mainstream, but you know, it sort of broke out of a little niche, really. It had always been a bit of a cult niche, and for a, for a moment there, for a few years with the, with the other albums, it, it broke out into the sort of, um, yeah, the mainstream. I a time where we managed to step up a little bit. The In Absentia tour, my memory of it was going round in a van and sharing rooms in awful hotels. This time we'd got a proper tour bus, um, but still pretty grim touring. You know, the clubs, the backstage. It was a culture shock for me because as a session drummer, I'd been working for this um, Italian star and it was really five-star hotels, limousines, and uh, your own dressing room, you know, and playing to 90,000 people. So it was a shock for me anyway, to, to go back to touring small, somewhat dirty, grimy clubs with a rough backstage and, you know, kind of more rock and roll kind of, a, more of a rock and roll experience anyway. Oh, in those days it was very, very much incremental and I think we, we, we kind of had a production that was beyond our status. You know, um, in the early days myself and Chris Maitland always tried to infuse some kind of uh, awareness of production values into the group. <laughs> we were trying to get lights to, you know, to work with the music and the stage to be clean and, and then when, obviously when Gavin joined, you know, the, with, with, with his kind of professionalism, um, we both tried to, to keep that going and to, to think of ways to increase the production value. So, yeah, we found ourselves playing quite, quite small venues, but with a film, with production, and I think it was quite an impressive thing to see. Yeah, I mean, it's funny watching back the footage uh, from the, because we filmed a, a lot, of, Lassa filmed a lot of them, uh, footage on the American tour, and it is being reminded of that fact that we were somewhere, we were somewhere between. So one night we would be playing on a, you know, a bunch of upturned beer crates in the corner of a bar in Syracuse. And then the next night we'd be playing, uh, you know, a big venue, sold out venue in Chicago, 
and then the next night we'd be back to playing to 20 people in a bar in, I don't know, Albuquerque or whatever it is. And, and it, it, it's a reminder of the fact that the band were still, the, the, the word of mouth was in effect, but it was still working. It was still not, you know, we still hadn't really reached um, a lot of the people that I think would ultimately come to discover the band. We were still in the process of reaching those people. And I'm sure at the time it was quite tough. I don't remember, but I'm sure that was quite depressing having to go from, from one extreme to the other for almost, almost on a nightly basis. But we were young, or we were younger anyway, and, and I think we were still enjoying the, just the experience of being on the road, being on a tour bus, being in America, discovering what it's like to be at that level. It was quite new to us. Yeah, but yeah, but, but what you yeah, you think that's just that rhythm, but but one is doing five, one is doing four. Okay. You know, when I look at a lot of the tour footage and stuff, although it looks a bit grim, it's still enjoyable at that point. You know, where you're all on the same page and you're all got a common goal. Um, so the you know the dressing rooms or the the lack of sleep or a lot of the things on tour don't. Um, don't get you so much because you feel you're all together in the same in the same boat, and um, you, you can enjoy you can enjoy that process. Yeah, I mean, some places there's always a few safe towns like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Boston, Philadelphia. Outside of those main cities, yeah, you can have some rough nights in some small clubs, uh, especially when the audience don't really, or the, the, you know, you're not that well known. So you might end up playing in some pretty small clubs some nights and on other nights in those big towns, you might be able to play a reasonably large theatre. Hey Cincinnati, this is Stephen Wilson from Porcupine Tree. Get on your straight jacket because you're in the rubber room with the dude on WEBN. We were getting um, articles in, in magazines that didn't touch us before, you know. So we'd stepped out of the niche <laughs> that we were in, which was great. It was a great feeling, of course, you know, to, to, it's a bit of vindication in a way, really. You're slogging away for ages. And you, get, you don't necessarily do it for the recognition, but when you get the recognition, it's really, really nice. It's really um, satisfying in that sense, you know. LA Weekly, when Shallow came out, it had a quote about the song, and it said, Dick wagging chord progressions, roller coaster melodies. What the hell are you guys putting out here? The four of us, the core of Portland Country, we were, we were all feeling the surreal experience of being English people going to this crazy place, America, and seeing it through the eyes of, of, of an English person. Hit me, hit me, hit me. There's no glitz and glamour touring on a, on a bus. You might think so. Some of the buses are very nice, but you've got to try and sleep in a quite confined space. It's not that far off, I imagine, being in prison or something. <laughs> well, well, the worst aspect is quite obvious that you're cooped up with a bunch of people. So you have to be able to get along on multiple levels, really. You have to be able to kind of, you know, um, your, any, anyone's kind of personal um, traits are kind of magnified in that environment. And of course, at the same time, you're sort of blind to your own. It's nice to engage with people and uh, get to know people again, because, you know, we don't always see much of each other off for tours. I remember the first tour bus I got on with Porcupine Tree, I put my elbow on the mattress and my fingers touched the roof. So that is how much space you've got. If you're a little bit claustrophobic, uh, it's not going to be the life for you. But depending on the size of the crew, you could have, you know, 14 people or 12 people on a bus. And that's really tight. It's like being on Big Brother in a submarine. You sleep very badly, but after a few nights, you're so tired you would sleep through a hurricane. In the end, you just pass out. Along the journey, you find little pockets of space and time where you can meet interesting people or do interesting things. So there's always some nice memories from it and obviously the gigs themselves. But uh, yeah, for a lot of the time, it, 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 you can get kind of cabin fever. I always love travel, love going to different places, seeing different things and sometimes, you know, the unexpected 
opening opening yourself up to the sort of unexpected meetings or um, you know and at the end of the day doing the gigs is, is always you know always something I enjoyed you know I think I was still slightly in a daze that this was my job how did that happen <laughs> you know how did that happen I'm, I'm on this tour bus touring America with these amazing musicians playing this amazing music every night and people are turning up to see us play uh, in you know in the days long before I became cynical and jaded that was still that was still amazing to me I don't know if it was on that that tour but starting to see people show up with tattoos was really odd. I mean incredibly flattering you know incredibly flattering but also a bit scary I think a, a man actually did do the Alan Partridge on me and lifted up his shirt and he had my face <laughs> tattooed on his body that was really odd no no I've never had that I've um, I mean in the very early days with my old band Japan when we first went over to Japan, we would get mobbed. And I've had chains wrapped around my ankles and pulled so that it would bring me to the floor. And then the mob could then crowd in. That degree of fan obsession, fan engagement, is, is something extraordinary to behold when you're the subject of it. And I, the thing is, I can totally understand that. I don't think I've ever been that obsessive about an artist that I would tattoo their face on my body. But, but um, I understand the nature of, of being a fan. You know, I've, this, I've been very lucky to work with some of the people whose music I grew up being influenced by. And, and there is a sense of awe that you hold them in. And to be the subject of that, and I still don't feel comfortable with it. I don't think anyone ever does. I'm sure Elton John even still doesn't feel comfortable with that kind of look that you get from someone that's completely in awe of you. I don't think you ever get used to that. Um, but to be on the receiving end of it is quite surreal. And I remember it beginning to feel that on, on those early um, US tours. Sometimes you meet people that are really kind of over enthusiastic, especially Americans, you know, they're kind of like um, really, really, really up for it, you know, really enthusiastic, which is great, <laughs> but it kind, of, kind of wears you out. After driving 13 hours, we stayed around and we still did not get to meet them. And I still haven't yet. And That's I'm blooming right. going to meet you one day, Steve. <laughs> it may not be today, may not be tomorrow, but I'll bloom and get to meet you. And Americans being Americans, they always take it slightly further than, than the Europeans do. Americans really know how to be obsessive fans, bless them. Uh, so I, I think most of the people that I've met over the years that have got my face tattooed on various parts of their, their body have always been Americans. I'm from New Bedford, Massachusetts. I like to speak with an English accent only when I've had a few bits of pints of lager. The difficulty is, you know, you can't turn it off, so you might feel a terrible, you've had a terrible night's sleep on the bus and you get up and then there's someone there who's been dying to come to the gig and wants you to sign their record and you know, it's like, I oh, really, I need a coffee, you know, that kind of thing. It's fucking badass anyway and I was really excited to be here and it was fun. You know, if it, in the, God dude, da Gavin's fucking ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, the people who've come to your show, they, you know, they're very supportive, of course. They've bought the album, they bought the ticket, they're enthusiastic to meet you. We did a few installs and it was, uh, it was really nice to meet them. The, the signings, people literally being so excited, they couldn't speak, you know. So wh why, why are you, it's just me, you know. And I, th I felt slightly fraudulent, you know, but, um, but maybe, maybe that's the way everyone feels in, in that position. After the show, we would generally you know, go and sort of um, sign some stuff and, and say hello. And you, you couldn't really escape that, even if you wanted to. But it was nice. It's nice to, nice to engage, engage with, with the supporters of our music. It's great. Um, of course, as time goes on, that becomes more and more difficult. Well, we drove about two and a half hours to come see Pork Pine Tree. So pork Pine Tree is definitely very underrated. They're the next Pink Floyd in my, in my eyes, definitely, in my ears, definitely. Uh, Steve's an unbelievable musician, and the rest of the band definitely around him. Definitely, totally feed off the vibe. It's awesome. But there's always something thrilling about when a kid in his teens or, you know, early 20s, someone still at university, is a fan. Because you think, ah, oh, next generation. 
you know the music is crossing it's not just for sad middle-aged men like me something about it that is crossing into a younger generation and that kind of tells me in the back of my mind the music will survive it will have some degree of immortality and I think part of me has always aspired to that that it's lovely to have fans now but where's your music going to be in 50 years, 100 years after you're, after you're gone? We all know the Beatles are still going to be around. We still all know ABBA's going to be around. Pink Floyd's going to be around. Wouldn't it be nice to think my, some of my songs are also going to be around? So in a, in a little way, when you see younger fans, it kind of reinforces that idea. You know, maybe the music has got some immortality to it. Maybe it will last. Maybe it will continue to be rediscovered and passed down so that people might still be listening to it in 50 or 100 years. And sometimes you get whole families come along, dads with their, their young kids, and the young kids have been brainwashed by the dads. Um, I love that, you know, and, I st and we started to see that again on that too. See, I, I, I like the, uh, the bonus tracks, actually. So, I mean, I, I would probably say Half Light turned into this beautiful, beautiful melancholic kind of um, psalm, almost, like a, like a, a sort of kind of prayer. Such a pale light. Something like Half Light, when we did that live, loads of people loved it, you know. A lot of the sort of audience uh, discussion around that song was that it was a really kind of powerful moment. Pick up that key. Yeah, I always liked Half Light. Uh, you know, not really a drummy sort of track, but I just, I just thought it was a beautiful piece. And um, I thought that came out really nice. Sort of anthemic, but also you could imagine it as a choral piece as well. So I, th I think that track could have been done in a lot of different ways and still can. I, I think that, yeah, that exceeded what I thought it might be when I first heard it, yeah. It was one of those ones, shall we end with Half Light or Glass Arm Shattering? There's nearly always one or two songs that are similar and then you think, well, if that one's on the album, we can't put that one on. So one's going to go and one's going to stay. You have the debate, you leave it, you know, you make your choice. And then years later, you think, actually, I prefer the other one. <laughs> Always the way, isn't it? Uh, Mellotron Scratch. Um, I really love this song. In fact, for me, there are three, three real pinnacles on the record which are Lazarus arriving somewhere not here and Mellotron scratch um, arriving somewhere but not here and Lazarus are kind of accepted as as by the fan base I think as among the band's classic material I don't think Mellotron scratch is but but I think it's uh, one of the best pieces I, I, I wrote for the band and it has a beautiful shape to it you know I like Obviously, a lot of the songs fall into this category, but, but specifically songs like Mellotron Scratch and Arriving Somewhere But Not Here, they don't end up the way you, they start. They, they, take you they take you in unexpected directions into, different, into unexpected places. I love the way Stephen uses harmonies. I love his vocal melodies and, and his backing vocals. They're, they're quite creative backing vocals and they, they often run in a, it's, it's not the usual thing of the oohs and ahs necessarily or block backing vocals. Sometimes there are whole phrases that are counter to the lead melody, but at some points they come together and then they drift apart again. And, uh, you know, I mean, I like the, the Beach Boys. It's, it's not a million miles away from the Beach Boys stuff. But the way he puts together melodies and, and arrangements, um, I think is, is a big thing for me. Twisted, warped, 
I think it, it, there's a lot of kind of sound mangling and, and um, even the voices are kind of uh, affected quite heavily. A lot of lo-fi voices from Stephen. Um, there's a lot of kind of swirling textures. It's quite, um, it is dark. Um, what's it like? It's like a box of snakes. Ambitious. Uh, it's a mix of classic rock. You know, I'm thinking of Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. And uh, more kind of contemporary stuff. And I think I'd call it a very, very strong consolidation of sounds that we kind of um, arrived at. Um, we're certainly having Gavin join the band, a more muscular, more metal elements were in the sound. And Deadwing felt like a very strong consolidation of that. For my experience, it was the first time I got involved in the album from the ground up. And that was quite exciting, getting involved in the writing, and we also uh, recorded it ourselves. In fact, I recorded the drums right here. Compared to some of our records, it's not dark anyway. I mean, you know, film was basically a somewhere between a, a psychological horror movie and a, a romance. It was about a, a relationship between a mother and a child, so not a that kind of romance, but a kind of a parental bond that kind of um, was so strong that it went beyond death. You know, that was the, <laughs> that was the idea. But it was a very, I think it was a very beautiful story, and and so. The songs that draw from from the album, I think, are they are you know certainly relative to a lot of my songs, they are a little bit more positive and a little bit more optimistic. I think Lazarus is an incredibly beautiful love song, for example. Follow me down to the valley. say I think in a way there's something about the feeling behind that song that transcends the specifics of the characters and the lyrics. It's the closest Porcupine Tree ever got to making a, a, an album of love songs and that and I do say that that is a, vel re a very relative thing because it's still a million miles away from being an album of love songs but it has that I think it has that aspect to it. We had a power at that point um, we were going through our imperial phase, if, uh, to me anyway, and I know some fans pr maybe prefer some of the earlier albums, but to me, no, everything was kind of leading up to In Absentia and the two records that followed it. Artistically, it's not necessarily the most successful record, um, but it was a much more successful record commercially than, than what came before it. And it, I think um, it led us into probably what became the best record. There's a few frustrations about Maybe I think it would have been better to have done what we did with uh, Fear of a Blank Planet, which was to play it live. Yeah, I mean, when you release an album, it's quite typical that the audience hate it because they don't, they're unfamiliar with it. And it's not a classic until at least 10 years have gone by. Maybe 20 years is better for people to look back and go, oh, it's an absolute classic. And maybe 20 years from Deadwing, people will say, oh, that was an absolute classic. But I can remember, quite a lot of bad vibes and hate towards it at the time and that probably was true of every record we released. The reality is, we so Mike has basically rewritten the script, I, I wasn't involved in the rewrite, I was too busy alas, but he's rewritten the script and it's great and it's, and it's now called A No Birds Sing and the main difference this time is that we've scaled the movie, or he has scaled the movie down to something that could be shot um, on iPhones, you know, that, that's, that's the idea. And in fact, we shot, just before COVID, we shot a very brief trailer using some student actors to just try and get a feel for how it might look and how it might play out. Um, and we had fun doing that. She only said, the night is dreary, he cometh not, she said. She said, I'm weary, a weary, I would that I were dead. It's good, and, and I was able to explore the sound design aspects, which were kind of central. So just to just to, to clarify that, the main character is a working in Soho as a sound designer. So there was a lot of 
um, there is a lot of emphasis on sound and the way sound is used almost in place of dialogue. And that was deliberate because I think we, because we knew it was always going to be a low budget movie and we may not be able to attract the greatest actors. We might be having to rely on student actors and, and, and more. And we thought, okay, let's minimise the dialogue. So, so in this new version, Mike has even minimised the di dialogue even more. There has been a proliferation of low budget movie makers and you 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 are now in a world where there's probably 10 times as many people making movies on iPhones and trying to get Netflix to produce them or BFI to finance them. So in a way, having left it 10 years has made it easier for us to make the movie, but we're also aware that we're now in a in a even more crowded field than we would have been 20 years ago. I, I think it, it would still be very much a vanity, labour of love project. But at the same time, there's nothing wrong with that. I could argue that my whole career has been a series of vanity, you know, labour of love projects um, and continues to be that way. She only said, the night is dreary, he cometh not, she said. She said, I'm a weary, a weary. I would that I were dead. They're true to their music. They're, they're not doing anything that they don't want to do. And they're not, they're not uh, giving in and just doing what a record company tells them to. They're follow, following their, their dreams and, and doing it the way they think that it should be done so the music stays pure. I think it's a really good record. It has some of, I think, some of my favourite songs I've ever written for the band. Um, Arriving Somewhere But Not Here, Lazarus, Malatron Scratch, and a few tracks that maybe aren't quite as good as those, which, which for me perhaps position it just below the peak of, of the record before and after. I'm very happy with it. Uh, I know most people put the attention on In Absentia and Fear of a Blank Planet, but I think the songs are really good, the performance is really good, and for me it was an exciting time because of the being involved in the creative process behind the album. So, yeah, I, I really like it. I can only now I can really appreciate exactly what a unique sound it was. Um, with Gavin's sort of hard contemporary edge to the drumming, Richard's sound design, my songwriting, the metal riffs. Um, there's something about that, that porcupine tree sound that is instantly recognisable, but I wasn't aware of it at the time. It was like I was almost too close to the mirror, you know, and now I can step back from the mirror and I can see, oh wow, we really had, and I can see all the bands that have imitated it since, um, which is, you know, again, flattering. None of them are as good as us, of course, but, um, but I, can, I can hear that we did create something quite, um, Quite original in a way. It was a great record that struggled to find an audience at the time, but over time has continued to be rediscovered. Follow.